This is Port Stories, brought to you by the Ports Past and Present Project. Sharing stories from five ports in Ireland and Wales. Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock. Project funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. Hello and welcome to this second episode of the Port Stories podcast by the Ports Past and Present team. In this episode, you'll hear a recording from the 21st of January 2021 of a webinar on coastal Brexit uh, that was part of and the inaugural uh, podcast of the Coastal Connection series uh, of partnership seminars funded by the Institute for Historical Research at the University of London. And you'll hear my colleagues, Dr. Jonathan Evershed, uh, Professor Rhys Jones, uh, Gronje Nia and Kieran O'Driscoll discussing uh, the complexities of Brexit across the Irish Sea. And I hope you enjoy it. So essentially, introducing the coastal Brexit topic. So uh, this partially comes out of um, a variety of uh, policy-based, um, journalism-based academic interventions across the Irish Sea between, you know, in these islands, uh, Ireland and uh, Great Britain, Northern Ireland, of, of the changing and fastly evolving situation around Brexit and the now hard border across the Irish Sea and some of the implications, conceptual, practical, logistical, infrastructural of, of what happened at the turn of the year and that we are very recently into and of which my colleagues are all in their respective areas are uh, very knowledgeable. Um, we'll go through in order. So to begin, I'm going to invite my colleague, Jonathan Evershed, Dr. Jonathan Evershed, who is on the Ports Past and Present project with me. Uh, we work, he's um, working with uh, stakeholder engagement for our project with port communities on both sides of the Irish Sea. But in addition, in another life, he was a on a Brexit project um, and uh, has uh, taken that expertise into his current role with um, our Ports Past and Present project. Um, he'll talk for 10 minutes, then we'll move on um, to Rhys Jones, our second speaker, then Gronje Nia, our third speaker. I'll introduce everyone in turn, and finally, Kieran Driscoll, who will be our fourth and final speaker, and then we'll go into Q&A. So uh, I will just uh, load up a slide, and I'll then um, mute myself and ask uh, Jonathan to introduce his top part of our discussion. Thanks very much, James, uh, and uh, thank you for the invite to participate in the uh, in this seminar. Thanks to the Coastal Connections uh, Network for the invite. Um, I'm going to do something that I don't usually do, which is a little bit unconventional for me, and I'm, I've, I've made some notes that I'm going to at least begin by reading from, um, in part uh, because I hope this will help keep me to time in part because I've tried to tie a few different threads of ideas together um, and in part because I wanted to demonstrate uh, preparedness for this event which goes above and beyond that which I often demonstrate when I'm speaking at seminars. Um, so um, like I say I'm going to be reading uh, or at least to begin with um, my, my kind of opening remarks and my intervention in this seminar to start. But just before I do that, can I just check there? You can hear me, James, and, uh, and on that basis, I'll proceed. You can hear me? Yep, all good, brilliant. So um, my opening comments this evening reflect some of the conclusions I've drawn from a, a one-day online conference on Europe and the future of Ireland's ports, coastal communities and maritime sector, which I convened for the Irish Association of Contemporary European Studies uh, in November 2020. Um, full videos of the day's proceedings across three different roundtable discussions are available to view at iacs.ie 
Um, and I would like to acknowledge at the outset the support of the Department of Foreign Affairs Communicating Europe initiative, which made the conference possible, uh, as well as express my gratitude for all of those who contributed to that conference, uh, one of whom uh, is also here this evening, uh, to whom I'm, I'm particularly indebted in ways that will become clear, I think, for some of my ideas um, and uh, reflections on coastal Brexit. Uh, my remarks this evening pertain primarily to the island of Ireland, um, but given the depth and endurance of the relationships between these islands, um, that depth and endurance of relationships really very starkly revealed by the Brexit process and challenged by it. Um, my comments inevitably also implicate and are also about this island's relationship with Great Britain and the European continent. And these relationships are all ultimately mediated in one way, shape or form by the sea. I suppose the too long didn't read version of my intervention this evening is precisely that Brexit is necessarily and definitionally about the sea and it has forced for good and for ill a political economic return to the sea for the North Atlantic archipelago as a whole uh, and for the island of Ireland in particular. This should be and already is um, accompanied by a political cultural return to the sea to seize coasts and ports as islands and these islands confront their post-Brexit, post-Covid and climate changed future. Um, so that's the TLDR version and one thing I'd like to flag before I really get going is that one thing I've learned as someone studying and working on Brexit for a number of years now is that key claims about Brexit can become wrong at the very moment that you've uttered them. Um, I once went on the BBC World Service and confidently predicted that the DUP would back Theresa May's Brexit deal. Um, so that's an important caveat to anything I'm going to say this evening. Uh, and it's likely the, the case that any predictions or claims that I make here um, will be um, proven false by as early as tomorrow. But nonetheless, uh, proceed in confidence and uh, hopefully say something meaningful about Brexit uh, and the island of Ireland and Ireland's relationship with the sea. A key theme of the IAC's conference uh, in November, uh, as it was put so eloquently by Kieron, who I, I hope won't mind that I'm stealing one of his best lines, uh, was that Ireland is an island nation with the outlook of one that is landlocked. To put it slightly differently, in the words of, of Nicholas, uh, Professor Nicholas Allen, Ireland is an island that forgot itself. Uh, Professor Claire Connolly, uh, a colleague of, of James and Reese and mine on the Ports Past and Present project uh, and a project lead on that project has identified how Ireland's relationship with its seas, coasts and ports has long been uncomfortable and defined by feelings of unease, dizziness and seasickness. These relationships have been shaped by the violence of empire, and a political culture which attaches primary importance to agriculture, land and land ownership, or as Kieron put it in November, the soil beneath our feet. Despite that Ireland's religious, industrial, demographic and geopolitical histories have all been shaped by the sea, seas, coasts and the maritime feature surprisingly little in the Irish political cultural imaginary, which tends to privilege history, per se, and particular historiographies shaped by forms of land-based methodological nationalism. As Gillian O'Brien identified in her contribution to the conference, there are a small number of local maritime museums dotted around the island, but there is no meaningfully national maritime museum which seeks to tell an overarching national story about Ireland and the sea. Governance of Ireland's coast coasts, ports and seas is similarly fragmented. This sea blindness has all had implications for Irish politics, culture and economics. And as the island of Ireland confronts new post-Brexit trading and geopolitical realities, it is arguably unsustainable. As Colm O'Mongoin put it on last week's RTE Brexit Republic podcast, which is something of a one-stop shop for any Brexit aficionados who want to hear a little bit more about Brexit. 
uh, in case there isn't quite enough coverage out there for all of us. Brexit has presaged a renewed and, uh, to quote uh, Colm, a desperate turn to the sea in Ireland. And that's perhaps no better reflected by um, this image, which sort of serendipitously appeared yesterday ahead of today's event, um, which maps the new routes, sea routes that connect Ireland with the European continent uh, by uh, circumventing uh, the island of Great Britain, which, uh, as one tweet puts it that I saw, now appears as something of a kind of sandbar in the way of Ireland's new relationship with the European continent after Brexit. At the risk of stating the obvious, it is difficult to overstate how fundamental a change Brexit represents for trading relationships within and between the UK and Ireland. I don't claim any great logistical expertise and I rely here on the work of, of Gronje, among others, uh, and I'm, I'm lucky to have colleagues who are experts, including Kieran and, and Seamus Lehany um, of um, Logistics UK, who was another of the speakers at the IAC's conference. As we speak, supply chains uh, are undergoing profound and enduring shifts. Take the Dublin Holyhead ferry route, for example, which had, since the completion of the European single market, become central to all, all island supply lines and to exports and imports on both sides of the Irish border. Transit between Dublin and Holyhead has been an important link in the so-called land bridge connecting Ireland with mainland Europe. In 2018, around 40% of total Irish trade was facilitated through this link with the UK. That means around 150,000 lorries crossing to the European mainland via UK ports every year. New Brexit related requirements at Dublin and Holyhead have disrupted these trade flows with new paperwork and checks on goods, lack of integration between British and Irish IT systems, and lack of preparedness for new regulations on the part of British businesses causing major delays. These delays look set only to increase as freight transport levels increase from their post-Brexit, post-Christmas lows. Since the 1st of January, there has been a 70% slump in year-on-year -year trade on the Dublin to Holyhead route, as traders and hauliers have opted out of new checks at both ends of the UK land bridge. In the face of a perfect storm of reduced passenger numbers due to COVID-19 and reduced freight traffic, Stenoline has cut services on both this and its Rosslair to Fishguard routes over several weeks. Meanwhile, and as demonstrated in the image, demand on new direct routes between Ireland, including via Dublin and Cork, but particularly Rosslair, and the European continent is booming and Brexit busting ferry services have diverted traffic from Ireland to GB routes. Uh, Stenoline's new enormous ferry, the Embler, uh, was previously destined for the Belfast to Birkenhead route, but is now serving Rosslare to Cherbourg. There is perhaps more than a hint of historical symbolic irony in that one of these new regular sailings from Rosslare bypasses the UK land bridge on its way to the port of Dunkirk. This all comes with growth opportunities for and investment in Irish ports and particularly in Rosslare. And this in turn comes with the risk that the communities which surround, support and depend upon these ports may be bulldozed in the literal sense to clear the way for changing political economic tides. But Brexit also potentially recasts port towns and their environs not as peripheral on the outer edges of Ireland's political community but is central to the new pan-European and global lines of trade, exchange and movement, which now shape Ireland's relationships with its neighbours. Perhaps there are opportunities for Ireland's port communities, historically marginal and multiply deprived here. This relies, I think, on Irish political culture catching up with its political economy in returning to the sea. There are some signs that this is already underway, with emerging scholarship, including Nicholas Allen's new book, Sea Tangled, re-examining Ireland's relationship with its seas. The work undertaken by La Joy in his position as Dublin Port Heritage Director, 
um, work that is not without its uh, difficulties, tensions and conflicts, but nonetheless, which provides a useful example as to how Irish um, cult maritime culture and heritage can be promoted and leveraged to engage communities in a contemporary relationship with ports, coasts and the sea. Dublin Port's creative programme, its plans to develop a heritage hub, are potentially models to be adopted and adapted elsewhere. And our own Port's past and present projects also seeks to make a modest contribution to this work. So to sum up, Brexit has revealed how Ireland's place in the world is mediated through the sea and its ports provide a lens through which this island's history, culture and contemporary politics and economics are all filtered. Brexit also forces a new acknowledgement of this and this should be embraced. Doing so may help to reorient Irish self-understandings, uh, recalibrate Ireland's relationships with the other island in this archipelago, recasting the Irish and Celtic seas as central rather than as peripheral to a Dublin-London relationship that often bypasses or leapfrogs the coast, uh, and uh, reorienting uh, Ireland's relationships with its European neighbours and with the wider world. So I'll leave it there for now and hopefully uh, have the opportunity to pick up on some of those ideas and themes in the Q&A. Thank you very much, James. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, so second in our order of uh, business is um, Rhys Jones, who's a professor um, in geography at Aberystwyth University. Um, Jonathan and Rhys are kind of the Irish sea duo in that they recently wrote an article that's very worth looking up for the conversation about, um, from a sort of um, Welsh Irish perspective about the readiness of ports in the face of Brexit. And um, we'll now hear a bit um, sort of more about the Welsh side of the perspective and other things from Rhys. So, and just let me know Rhys when you want me to move the slides on. Uh, you're muted still Rhys, sorry. Thanks a lot, uh, James. You'd have thought I've, I'd have learned by now how to unmute uh, before I start speaking, but uh, thanks for introducing me as part of one half of a, an Irish sea duo with Jonathan. I'm not sure what, what I really think about that, but it almost makes it sound like some easy listening kind of group, I think. Maybe there's a, a future for us there. Um, thanks a lot for um, organising the event and thanks for the opportunity uh, to, to speak tonight as well. And it's been really interesting to see the, the mix of people here. And, uh, and it'd be great to see the ideas that have been discussed um, by all the speakers and obviously by the, by the listeners as well uh, later on. Um, I think in, in searching for, for something coherent to say this evening, um, I think what struck me um, are the stories um, that uh, are told to us, um, the stories that we tell ourselves as well about uh, borders, about borders in general, um, but also the stories that are told to us, the stories we tell ourselves uh, about borders in the context, in the specific context of, of Brexit. Um, I think you can probably move on to the next slide, thanks uh, James. I think we, we tend to think about borders as, as physical things, um, as infrastructures that have massive real world consequences and almost because of that, it's things that, that almost lie beyond narration, if you like, beyond stories. But if Brexit has shown us one thing, I think it's shown us that the power of stories, um, stories of the UK being overwhelmed by Turkish migrants, um, if we were to stay and to continue to stay in the EU, um, stories of the um, extra 350 million pounds that would be spent on the NHS every week, uh, if the UK were to leave the EU. And also stories about, um, say, the significance of, of fishing for Britain, uh, for its economy, for its people, for its identity in some respects. Now, these are all uh, accounts of realities that are, that are, that are very often partial. Uh, they're very often stories that hide as much as they reveal. 
But I want to focus on, on three kinds of stories uh, in, in, in my talk uh, this evening, really. Uh, three kinds of stories about the nature um, of borders in general, um, but also I think that they are stories uh, about borders that have inhabited uh, the Brexit debate and, and continue to um, affect the way we think about uh, borders in this immediate post-Brexit era. So first of all, uh, maybe the first story I want to talk about um, on the next slide um, is, you know, stories about where the border is. Where is the border? Where do we locate um, the border? And I think very often uh, we tend to think about borders as defined and uh, demarcated lines on maps. So to me as a geographer, that would be my um, almost go-to way of thinking about borders. But you know, more generally, you can think about Trump's talk, thankfully in the past now, um, Trump, Trump's talk of the need for a wall uh, between the US and Mexico. That kind of talk conditions us to think of a border that is precisely defined, um, something that is precisely demarcated. Bricks, barbed wire, um, all of these create concrete borders. They create, in our minds at least, uh, very narrow, very thin lines on maps. And yet, work in, in geography and, and further afield as well has shown that borders um, can become stretched. Uh, they can be uh, elongated widthways or sideways, I'm not really sure how the best, uh, what the best way is to, to, to almost to say that. But borders, in effect, can extend well away um, from the, those locations where we tend to, to, to witness them, where we tend to think about them. And there are you know, numerous examples of different ways in which we can think about this. Uh, we can think about um, the efforts made by countries such as Australia to create migrant processing centres uh, on islands that are located far, far beyond the country's uh, land border. Um, and it's almost a case of out of sight, out of mind, um, as Alan, Alison Nance has argued, in relation to this attempt to, to distance the border, if you like, um, to send it further afield so that you can process uh, migrants in ways where, where nobody, or in places where nobody can actually witness what is happening. Nick Gill, uh, the geographer Nick Gill, has shown uh, in the context of the UK how uh, processing uh, centres for asylum seekers um, are located in very inconspicuous places, uh, very unremarkable places, but importantly, places that are, that are far inland, places like Basingstoke. Um, and, and the, you know, these asylum processing centres are located far, far inland. So the border again moves uh, out of sight, out of mind, once again, perhaps in a, in a slightly different kind of, of context there. And of course, Brexit has only served to reinforce this idea of a, of a border that, that stretches in different directions. Certainly a border that extends well inland. Um, now, some of the more obvious examples uh, of Brexit stretching the border include the, the creation, as you can see in this picture, of a 66-acre lorry park near Ashford in Kent. Uh, as a site to manage the flow of lorries from the UK into France, or the equivalent contingency plans put in place on Anglesey in case of a no-deal Brexit, which included trying to designate an industrial estate, a lorry stop, even the, the A55 trunk road itself as, as part-time or potential part-time lorry parks. Uh, once again, to be, become part of an extended border between the UK and Ireland. And of course, these are the, the extended borders that, that we are more aware of. Um, there are other more hidden borders emerging, for instance, in, in various transport depots, 50 miles inland, 100 miles inland, as lorries are kept waiting well away from the actual border, if you like, for the right paperwork to enable their international transit to, to, to proceed. So where is the border? Where is the Brexit border in such circumstances? 
do we all live potentially nearer to the border than, than we might realize? And then moving on to, to the, the next slide then, please, James. The second kind of story I want to talk about is, is this idea of borders stopping movement or perhaps alternatively, uh, borders being defined uh, by movement. Now, a lot of the way which we, we tend to think about borders focuses on their role in, in stopping movement, in stopping mobility. For instance, stopping the flow of illegal Mexican immigrants and illegal drugs into the US, stopping the flow uh, of Palestinians as that wall on the left hand side tries to do, stopping the flow of Palestinians into Israel, stopping the, the potential flow of Turkish people in, into the UK as, as UK, as UK, sorry, um, uh, would have us believe. And yet as well as stopping movement, it, it's clear that that movement, the mobility in, in, in fundamental ways almost helps to define that border. Now, one way to think about this is in the context of the illegal movement of people and things. So the, the movement of people and, and things, people and goods from Mexico to the US at one level subverts the border while also bringing about calls to reinforce it, potentially reinforcing this idea of the border between Mexico and the US. The smuggling of petrol across the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic similarly undermines the border in some senses, whilst in other equally important senses maybe reaffirms the significance of the border. But even the legitimate movement of people and things across borders also brings meaning to those borders. And, and maybe I can um, refer back here a little bit to, to some of the themes that Jonathan uh, discussed in his talk. We can see this role of, of the, the legitimate movement of, movement of people and things um, bringing meaning to borders. Um, we can see this quite clearly um, in relation to the changing fortunes of the Irish and Welsh seaports post Brexit. As Jonathan mentioned, freight numbers in the Welsh ports are in decline, in, in decline in Holyhead, have been in decline in, in, in Fishguard as well. While places such as Dublin, Rosslare, Cork, we heard as well, uh, these ports have been energised because of the new and additional routes that now connect them with mainland Europe. So maybe trying to reflect on this, does this mean that instead of thinking about borders as lines that try to stop movement, do we need to think more about the way in which borders might only take on meaning when they are able to allow movement and mobility? Do borders only maintain their significance when they are crossed? And if so, how is Brexit with its emphasis on stopping flows and connections and movement, how is Brexit changing all that? And then on the, the next slide then, please, James, the final kind of story I want to, to refer to relates to the link between um, borders and identity. Now, long ago, um, anthropologist Frederick Bath argued that we define ourselves in opposition to others. So borders or boundaries between individuals and groups help to define, um, to use Edward Said's terms, the other and the self. Borders, therefore, are important for identity and especially an identity um, defined in oppositional terms, in binary terms, if you like. Uh, I'm Welsh because I'm not English. Uh, and I made a point there of, of getting a picture, quite difficult to get when a Wales scoring a try against England, I'm actually doing quite well there for once. Um, but I'm Welsh because I'm not English. Um, and Brexit has added to this oppositional kind of narrative. I'm British perhaps because I'm, I'm not European. But are there other ways in which we can think about the relationship between borders and identity? A different kind of way maybe that builds uh, in some respects on my earlier point of viewing borders as things that enable, even thrive on connection rather than merely being things that, that separate us. So early on in, in the Ports Past and, and Present project, um, 
And as, as uh, James and Jonathan have already mentioned, uh, um, um, uh, James and Jonathan are part of that project as well. Early on in that project, we heard the tale of a, of a street that connected Fishguard and Rosslare. It was a street that began in Fishguard, whose house numbers, if you like, began in Fishguard, and then whose house numbers continued and finished in the other, sorry, in the street's other half. It's twin, if you like, in Rosslare. So a street beginning in Fishguard, with numbers running up to a certain number, and then continuing and finishing in Rosslare. Now, how do we think about the, the relationship between borders and identities in that kind of context? Instead of viewing borders maybe as things that emphasize separation and opposition for identity, are there ways in which we can view borders as things that emphasize common and shared identities? And also building on that, if you like, shared histories, shared, a shared heritage, um, a sharing of the things that we value and celebrate. So one half of a street, or more to the point, maybe just a street in Fishguard, just a street in, in Rosslare, these aren't really things that we would view as being important aspects of heritage. And it's only when they're viewed together. It's only when they're viewed as two halves of a whole that crosses borders, uh, two halves of a whole that connect towns and communities on both sides of the Irish Sea. It's only then that these two streets become something worth celebrating. And without getting too highfalutin, there may be a, a lesson there, I think, uh, that we would do well to hold on to in these uh, turbulent uh, years post-Brexit. So I'll leave it to there. Thanks, Diach. Thanks very much, Rhys. And um, our third speaker is uh, Gronya Nye, who is a journalist for thejournal.ie and a Brexit specialist journalist uh, who has written quite a portfolio of Brexit coverage now, which um, uh, she, I imagine we'll hear a bit more about. But um, uh, I'll mute myself again and welcome you to talk, Gronya. Thank you, uh, James. Thank you for inviting me to this. It's a really interesting talk and there's a lot of interesting parts of Brexit. One of them is identity um, and, and, and another is kind of marginalisation, which um, Jonathan and, and Reese would have spoken about there, you know, the marginalisation of borders. I'm going to talk a bit about the practicalities and what fishermen and, you know, people along the coast have spoken to me about over the past couple of years. It's a really um, tangible part of Brexit and a very convoluted, bureaucratic, uh, technical debate that it seems like that a lot of the time um, but just to start off with you know Ireland's identity as an island and when you think of, of something really you know a big iconic part of Irish identity would be Aran jumpers they were worn originally by um, Irish fishermen and if they their bodies washed ashore in, in, a, in an accident that they would be able to be identified through that and that is such a huge integral part of Irish identity but we do have this kind of uh, I think it has been marginalized somewhat um, when you think about how strongly we feel about agricultural products and how strong the farming lobbies are here it is much much different than our fishing industry and I, that might have to do with our obsession with land here and how important land is. That might be an oversimplification of it. But I do think Brexit is a good uh, jumpstart in shifting how we view and how we prioritise um, different industries um, at the moment. Uh, when Brexit first happened, I remember looking into Loch Foyle, which is a dispute. It's an estuary between Donegal and Derry. And it's a disputed territory and I called the Department of Agriculture to ask them what's going to happen, you know, because of Brexit, what, what are the arrangements going to be? And a couple of days later I got a call back and, and a very distressed official said to me that they didn't know. They didn't know what was going to happen because of Brexit. This had been a disputed territory for years and they, they, they it's 
survived and it's worked that way. Same with Carlingford Lock. And now they were forced to reimagine this whole relationship that they had in this one small, tiny bit of battle, um, a sea kind of tiny body of water in, uh, in proportion to the, to the, the coast in general. Um, and they, they didn't know what was going to happen with it. Um, that is just one example of how complicated the Brexit debate is. Um, and, and it was completely framed, I suppose. It was, it was, there was a lot of things at the heart of it, but it was completely bookended by the fisheries debate. Um, at the start of the Brexit campaign, obviously a lot of people would have heard take back our waters, uh, which is a very strong, visceral mantra. And it seems really simple. And then you get into the debate and the question is, well, what are you going to give up by taking waters back? And one of the biggest, I think, learning points of Brexit and that we're only really getting into now is with trade, you give a little and you get a little. And if you want to take something back, is it worth the, the, the forfeiting of, of, of um, the, the benefits you get from that. And I'm going to come back to that a bit because that's something Irish fishermen have told me um, in the aftermath of Brexit, although they're not happy with arrangements now, they're not as um, sceptical of the EU arrangements as they once were. Um, one of the, I suppose, the reasons why fisheries is so um, such a flashpoint during the Brexit debate was because it is symbolic of how we an interact with other countries. Um, you think about countries defined by land masses, but what links a lot of them are bodies of water and they're shared between not just the country immediately next to you, but from massive um, uh, miles away, um, you know, and anything that happens somewhere else in the world will eventually affect us in terms of the, 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 the temperature of the waters, the waves that we get, they're all, they're all impacted by something else happening somewhere else in the world. Um, and Again, that's just something that Ireland, particularly post-Brexit, um, particularly because Brexit happened at the same time, the same four years that the Trump presidency was forced to reimagine itself, not just in Europe, but in the world, um, because everything was reframed by those two events happening at the exact same time. Um, the, the, when you look at the, the Take Back Our Waters campaign, the Brexit fisheries debate, um, a lot of fishing villages in the UK would be very, very um, pro-Brexit strongholds. Uh, and I think that the, the idea, the narrative, we're talking about stories and what, what sinks in with people, um, the narrative that the, the kind of succession to the EU or the ECC, that that was the reason why you know, more boats are ending up in your waters and you feel like something is being taken away from you if you're a fisherman. That narrative really um, took hold and, and kind of manifested itself in the other ways, but particularly in the fishing uh, community in an increasingly globalised world. Um, and I suppose the same debate didn't happen here in Ireland, but fishermen were aware of it here and were watching, you know, how things... Um, unfolded closely. And I think that's really important because when you think about the fishing communities in countries, they are small parts of the economy, minuscule parts of the economy. They don't make up a massive part of the workforce. They are completely emblematic of the type of voter or the type of citizen that is left behind often by governments. And when you, when you go into an election campaign, there is a big uh, focus on a vision for your country. Oftentimes that doesn't include a fishing community or our coasts or these types of things. They're more um, monetary uh, kind of um, ideas and policies that are sold. And I think that's a, that's a huge um, gap in kind of providing for a country either, you know, rural areas or in coastal communities. And I think it's something that the Irish government is very aware of here from what conversations I've had about what will be done post-Brexit. Again, um, something I'll, I'll mention about what their, their plans are um, in the next couple of years. When you look at the deal and talk about how important fisheries were and you look at the deal that was actually struck, 
uh, the UK government is kind of hoping for something a lot more substantial in a couple of years time but what they have now has kind of left a lot of people in Northern Ireland, in Ireland and in the UK um, fishing communities very very worried about their future. Um, I know in Ireland there is a huge financial package that has been given to, to fishermen to kind of um, establish themselves and in the UK I think a, a hundred um, million millions have been allocated to invest in the fishing community so that they are prepared to uh, reap I suppose the benefits of an increased um, fishing stock that they, will be available to them I think going up from 50% to 60% of their waters um, that is I think one half of looking at communities um, along the coasts in the UK and Ireland and how opportunities might present themselves purely by talking about what these coastal communities need and what should happen to them in a way that hasn't happened before. Um, I think before Irish fishermen would have been very sympathetic to the Brexit view, the anti kind of EU um approach to things because there was a lot of them who said to me that that we were sold out when we joined in 1973 which is the exact same thing that British fishermen have been saying and that you know they gave far much away to from of our waters and we don't have the same access that we should and when the Brexit debate started going on a lot of Irish fishermen were talking about we we're going to get an influx of boats from Spain and France and the Netherlands um, that are going to threaten our livelihoods when we're already struggling and who's going to look after the sustainability of the waters. Um, uh, one uh, person phrased it to me as it's like playing the World Cup but you're playing all the teams at once instead of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so that was the kind of fear about what was going to happen post-Brexit, that they were going to be inundated, that we were left by the wayside again and we left to fend for ourselves. And at the moment, the talk is a lot more toned down. It's a lot more, well, we need somewhere to sell our fish into. That point has been really hammered home for, for fishermen that, okay, we're going to catch more fish, but where are we going to sell it to? Um, it's not, you know, a, a British fisherman made the point that, that this deal is, is in some ways worse off than what they had before because previously with EU catches, they would have swapped with EU boats the, the parts of the fish that were less valuable to them to the to the UK market that would be more valuable to say a French or a or a Spanish kind of market and that isn't going to happen anymore um which is kind of one of the side effects I suppose of this um there's also the practicalities of how this deal will work you know when you look at lock foil and um, divide it down the middle you need access to one side to access the port. You can't just draw a line down the middle. And then there's also how do you police open waters? It's quite an expensive thing to do if you were to police a 200 nautical mile limit out off, off the, the UK or the Irish coast. Um, there's a lot of scope for here, I suppose, looking at the post-Brexit transition. There's a lot of scope for here for development of communities if the political will is there. Um, Already in Ireland, uh, it was agreed in the Dáil today that there will be a task force set up to look at how fishing communities and coastal communities will be affected by Brexit. And that just shows how ill-prepared they were. I suppose that work was really should have been something that was going to happen before now. Um, but it is being looked at now and it comes, I think, out of the absolute fear among fishing communities about what this means for them. Um, the, the, I suppose, just a, another a, a kind of a separate but also related topic when um, uh, when Fungi the dolphin went missing off the Kerry coast, a lot of people said to me that uh, they wouldn't have been allowed to stay in Dingle and Kerry, they wouldn't have been allowed to work and live their lives in an area of the country they wanted to if it wasn't for that dolphin, such a neglect of kind of resources and employment opportunities in that area and I think there is a link there to um, how you develop kind of coastal communities particularly as the climate change issue becomes more and more apparent and 
it's that that climate change issue is one of the reasons one of the main reasons why Ireland has recently well is going to apply for um, observer membership to the Arctic Council and when we're talking about how the ocean links everyone together that is something that um, uh, nor, um, Scandinavian countries have been quietly pushing at the Irish government to join because they realise that it's such an important conversation for Ireland um, and, and Arctic nations to kind of discuss uh, and that will have a lot of kind of conversations about how to integrate um, countries with a shared uh, body of water uh, between them particularly as climate change becomes more and more of an issue and um, so if that happens we were pro will probably see a lot more discussion here about what happens a couple of you know on different islands or on, on a couple of um, uh, uh, nautical miles away from us and um, just to to finish on kind of started on lock foil I'm going to finish on it um, there's there's a kind of a lot of a shared, you know, the, the policy of voisinage in, in fishing, fishing is, is kind of a, I think it means neighbourliness in, in French, I'm happy to be corrected on that, but it, I think it does um, encapsulate how the UK and Ireland in particular need to work together to create a kind of a sustainable um, approach post Brexit you know they won't have the EU where ministers meet and discuss new policy ideas they won't have that forum kind of to um, check in on each other and I think there is a lot of scope on um, the fisheries issue the the kind of shared islands the links this a bridge between um, Belfast and, and Scotland if Boris Johnson is to be believed that that could you know, invigorate, create a kind of a new foundation from which Anglo-Irish discussions can happen. Um, and Lockfoil is good and Carlingford Lock as well are good examples of why you need cooperation because there is no escaping uh, direct direct borders and there's no um, no way to police open sea, sea borders um, at, no matter what, you know, how many uh, kind of fish or uh, vessels you put on the sea or how many um, rules you put in place. Wonderful, thanks Grania. Um, and last but not least is um, uh, our fourth speaker, Kieran O'Driscoll, who's the Policy and Brexit Research Officer at the European Movement Ireland. And I know that you have a, a slide, so I'm just going to pull it up for you and share. Oh, um, and there we go and take it away perfect thanks very much i realize a map might be handy as i'm speaking just because it's a uh, maps always look good when you're talking about the sea um but let me just say uh, i prepared some notes um just to um uh, help guide ourselves uh, through the next uh, few minutes as i talk about uh, my uh, my uh, uh, issues i'm going to raise today uh, and uh, as um, as was, was raised, I'm the policy and research officer with the European Movement Ireland. Uh, and just to mention who we are, um, since uh, 1953, uh, we've been involved in facilitating uh, the connection and debate between all parts of Irish society and all things Europe. And uh, just to mention that today we successfully, after many times being delayed, our annual European of the Year award ceremony, which we are fortunate to uh, hold online today, but uh, we presented it, uh, a nice piece of water crystal to uh, Michel Bernier after all his work. And by God, he deserves all the water crystal after the last four and a half years. Uh, but you can listen back to that and you can find out more of our work and our upcoming events on europeanmovement.ie. Um, um, so I'll move on now to kind of uh, my uh, main topic for today. And I should point out, um, uh, and actually I was delighted uh, to hear so many of the things that Grania said, because I agree with them, because I come from a sea fishing family in Castle Bear in West Cork. Um, but then I've kind of studied European integration uh, since my master's uh, from the University of Limerick. So more or less everything that Grania was raising there, but the feelings of being left behind and everything else, there are things I've heard from my father and nearly every, every single person that I know at home who's connected to the, to, uh, to the sea and fishing. So um, while I'm um, always happy to talk about the European Union, um, not so much at home uh, for many of the reasons that uh, Grania raised there. But uh, now to the topic at hand. Um, the EU's common fisheries policy, uh, for all its often uh, valid criticisms and critiques over the last four decades or so, has been able to provide a, a, a general sense of predictability for fishers and the communities that they rely on. 
Um, yes, the outcomes of those annual quota settings for each stocks by EU fisheries ministers might not have always gone the way fishers or environmentalists might have liked, uh, but much in the way like high or low tide marks, the common fisheries policy did set parameters on expectations for all involved, providing a, a relative degree of stability from year to year. However, I do know there would be fierce disagreements over that statement from many stakeholders. Um, there have been also fierce disagreements in terms of the negotiations on fisheries uh, between the EU and the UK and the Brexit negotiations, as we've heard and we're all very much uh, aware of last year, um, with uh, fishers on both sides of the IRC voicing their deep dissatisfaction with the outcome for different reasons, as Grania mentioned uh, previously. Uh, in the case of Ireland, it was the reduction of our uh, share of key stocks. Uh, Ireland's Department of Agricultural Food and the Marine in an initial assessment uh, just released uh, last week expects that just under 43 million euros of Irish, in the value of Irish quotas in, our, in UK waters will be transferred to the UK during the five and a half year fisheries transition phase. Uh, while there is a path uh, for this transition phase until June 2026, uh, the questions arise as to just how much stability relative or not will exist in the broader fisheries management uh, in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, after the transition period, there will be annual negotiations to decide on the volume of fish the other party can catch in each other's waters. Many uh, EU fishers, and particularly Irish uh, fishers as well, will rightly be asking, and, the, and, and then what? Those uh, high and low water mark, uh, uh, those high and low water tide marks of the common fisheries policy will no longer be there. Uh, there was also the case that the EU was that external factor or the forum, which Gonya mentioned earlier on, um, uh, of oversight, um, uh, of being the oversight of enforcer and as a regulator, which now will no longer be in place as the UK will no longer be locked into the common fisheries policy. Indeed, uh, my uh, question is today, how will the UK behave outside the common fisheries policy? Um, will it pursue a meaningful set of negotiations to reach agreement, or which is my worry that the UK will pursue a course as being a disruptor. Uh, I'd like to highlight uh, two examples of when states can be, be disruptors to underline just how quickly um, fisheries in particular can climb the political ladder and can consume so much pol uh, political oxygen. The first, which many of you will know of course, uh, is the Cod Wars, which took place uh, between the UK and Iceland in the 1950s and again in the 1970s, and have sustained themselves rather successfully into public memory. This is where I was glad to email uh, the uh, uh, image of the map, just to kind of highlight distances and the areas of water that we're, we're uh, talking to uh, uh, about today. Uh, 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 the Cod Wars, it involved Iceland extending its territorial waters, first to four nautical miles in 1952, then to 12 in 1958, and uh, then to 50 in 1972, and finally to 200 in 1975. As each extension took place, so too did the opposition from the UK, in particular with the 50 and 200 nautical mile extensions, which, would, which did deprive their deep sea industry from accessing stocks present there. Uh, clashes between Icelandic Coast Guard patrol boats and the British Royal Navy vessels were quite common during those periods, with damages at one point to the Royal Navy costing one million pounds sterling, or about 13 million euros uh, in today's money. Uh, I, uh, at one point, Icelandic fishing vessels were also prevented from landing in British ports, which did harm the industry deeply at the time. Um, so much so that the Cod Wars drifted into uh, Cold War po politics, uh, where on several occasions, Iceland threatened, to, uh, threatened the removal of NATO operations from the country, and even questioned their continued NATO membership. Such was the pursuit uh, of their cause in sea fisheries, uh, that Iceland broke off diplomatic relations with the UK for several months in early 1976. Unwilling to allow this uh, dispute to persist among two members, NATO mediated uh, talks between the two in June 1976 and an, an agreement was reached. In the end, the UK uh, uh, recognised Iceland's 200 knot mile zone and permission was given for a limited number of UK vessels to operate in Icelandic waters. The outcome was a complete diplomatic and political fail, uh, uh, victory for Iceland compared to the UK, which as a result lost access to fishing grounds that economically devastated uh, English fishing ports in, in particular, such as Grimsby, Hull and Fleetwood. 
My uh, second example uh, is one uh, is one that is much more recent, uh, called the Macro Wars uh, from the early 2010s, which didn't quite capture the public's attention as much as the Cod Wars did. Um, I should explain that macro, and this is where the map comes in quite handy, is a highly migratory species, often moving south from off the, Nor the Norwegian coast uh, to off Scotland, and then between February and July they spawn off Western Ireland. So you can you can see that involves a huge area of the North Northeast Atlantic. Um, from about 2005, uh, uh, changing mackerel sho shoal patterns resulted in greater numbers of mackerel being found in the territorial waters of the Faroe Islands and Iceland. Uh, so much so that in 2010, both coastal states unilaterally raised their combined quota for the stock from uh, 27,000 to 215,000 uh, uh, tonnes. Uh, this continued to rise each year uh, with their joint quota rising in 2013 to just over 293,000 tonnes. Uh, both the EU and its ally, uh, and its, uh, ally in this dispute, Norway, believe that as a result, the Faroe Islands and Iceland were overfishing more than which was justifiable on the basis of scientific um, evidence. In March 2013, the Faroe Islands took similar uh, stances regarding herring, where it unilaterally began setting increased fishing quotas for their vessels. While all parties involved engaged unsuccessfully in rounds of negotiations from 2010 onwards, both the EU and Norway introduced sanctions against the two island nations, from banning their uh, vessels uh, landing at their ports to banning the importation of herring or mackerel. And the, the EU also uh, lowered its mackerel and herring quotas to prevent overfishing uh, taking place. The EU in particular uh, issued trade sanctions against, uh, the, uh, against Faroe seafood in August 2013 uh, as a result of the herring dispute. Um, such was the impact uh, that this and other uh, sanctions would have on the economy. Moody's downgraded uh, uh, the Faroese economy, or downgraded the, the Faroese financial outlook uh, at that time. Yet they persisted, uh, so much so in November 2013 uh, that the Faroese requested consultations with the EU under the WTO's dispute uh, settlement understanding. Uh, which was done on behalf of them by Denmark uh, over the dispute with Herring. Um, however, um, in spring 2014, after many rounds of negotiations, all parties had resolved both the Herring and the Merkel disputes um, that had led to an agreement. And the EU trade sanctions were eventually lifted in August of that year against the Faroe Islands. So uh, these two fisheries, uh, these two examples of fishery uh, disputes highlight, highlights, highlights the lengths that states will go to pursue their goals and how even strong actors such as the EU can have difficulty in yielding agreement uh, with those beyond it. And now with the UK to be operating outside of the common fisheries policy, how will it behave beyond the EU? While the tone of my presentation today is one of pessimism, um, I will conclude uh, with one for hope for the future. Uh, the EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement uh, does include mechanisms uh, that incentivizes the two parties to reach agreement in particular binding uh, fisheries to other aspects of the economic relationship. Uh, in the event that Heading 5, which is what fisheries is titled under in the agreement, is terminated, uh, which any of the parties is entitled to do, then uh, those headings related to trade, aviation and road transport, quote, shall cease to be in, in force, uh, shall cease to be in force on the first day of the ninth month following the date of notification. Um, it is uncertain how the EU-UK relationship will develop in the coming years and decades, and fisheries has such depth of potential to open relations between neighbours, and so often at the cost of sustainably exploiting fish stocks and the fishing communities that rely on them. It is my hope uh, that the annual agreements between the EU and UK will take place as quietly as the, the tides themselves. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion to follow. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll just uh, go back to uh, turning off the, the slides. So basically what I'm going to do at this point to reiterate what I said before, um, if people could put their questions in the chat, uh, I'll call them out and we can answer them. If you can make it clear, if you're asking a question to a specific person, like just make it clear who you're, who you're addressing or you can address everyone. Um, we did actually already have someone ask a question. Uh, 
do those who live on the coast have an understanding that the sea in front of them is not a barrier or border, but a gateway to the rest of the world? And I think you could add to that question the addendum in these times, I suppose, at in this moment, how are people imagining the coast as a, as a gateway? And that's, I think that could be an open question to all of you if you have any thoughts. I think a key point here is that, yeah, absolutely. Those, I think, in my experience with the Ports Past and Present project, has been that those who live in these port communities know very much um, what is shared across and between them. People often talk about the common experience of living in and working in and having a life that's shaped by um, a port uh, and a port town and that that experience is often shared. And we've already heard one very tangible example of that in both Fishguard and Rosslare where the street numbers are literally shared uh, between the two communities and those that sharedness is facilitated by and, and mediated by the sea in Fishguard um, the sea opens Fishguard which would otherwise be I hope anyone else here from Fishguard won't mind me saying this otherwise be a, a kind of peripheral and small town on the edge of the island of Great Britain opens it up to uh, tourists from America who stop there on cruises um, and who I know um, at first hand from having spoken to a number of people that work to promote and to tell the story of Fishguard to those tourists are kind of you know left eating out of the hands of tour guides uh, who have a real passion for and love for the place that they call home which they're very keen and, and willing to share with people that come to Fishguard uh, to spend time there on cruises and uh, who come into the town from the sea, who see this town from the sea rather than seeing it as kind of peripheral to um, relationships that are you know mediated by and dependent on the land. So I think that one thing that Brexit has really done for me and my work on Brexit and on the Ports Past and Present project has really recharacterized the Irish Sea Basin, not as a periphery, but as a center, as a central node on all sorts of uh, journeys across time, across space, uh, and that sea, not as a barrier, but as something that's facilitated those journeys, something that's defined those journeys, something that defines life in and across these different port towns, um, is something that is, has really struck me does anyone else have anything to add to that question? Uh, I might have something there. Um, I suppose um, when it comes to the question of like, you know, barriers or gateways with the, with the coastline, I suppose it, it all depends on the thing of geography. So for coming for me from West Cork, I suppose like the orientation towards like the Irish Sea, it may as well be like the Baltic Sea, because <laughs> it's for many it's quite far. So our orientation is, um, uh, I suppose, you know, even strong further where I suppose they have greater connections with the likes of like, maybe like France or Spain would have more of a connection than say maybe the Irish Sea if you're based over in West Cork, mostly because of the fishing traditions. Um, at one stage in Castlemore, there was a Spanish uh, music festival which was held um, previously. And then, of course, um, uh, you kind of had the kind of um, uh, historical French events where the, where the you know, French tried to invade Ireland through Bentry Bay several times, particularly in 1798. So, so for, and there's like, you know, landmarks with that in terms of the Martello, there might be, you know, the left over of the Martello Towers or Bentry Square is known as Wolftone Square. And there's an anchor uh, from one of the uh, Spanish uh, or the French ships that sank. So I suppose, you know, that's kind of where the orientation would, would be there based on, on the geography. Um, so while when the Irish Sea would be like, there's like that kind of barriers, you know, between Ireland or Wales or uh, so on and so forth. Um, for, I think, in places like that in West Cork, it, they are more that kind of gateway because it's either the, they're that direction to, to go fish or they're that direction for trade rather than anything to do with kind of a, a, a barrier. And that does, come, that does purely come down to the fact that the, if you go up the harbour's mouth of Castle Somewhere, the next place is Canada, you know, so we're not that too worried about um, viewing uh, the seas around us as kind of a barrier. Um, so that's my own thoughts about just growing up in that kind of particular part of the, the, the country. We just had a lovely story for our collection on the Ports Past and Present website about stone from uh, Waterford through New Ross ending up in the first, um, you know, Irish Catholic cathedral in Newfoundland in Canada. So, you know, that the kind of, yeah, you know, we're increasingly seeing those 
long expansive connections growing in our project as well. So we have another question. It struck me particularly in Reese's and Gonya's presentations, how coasts can be considered similarly to borders, both have edges or margins that can appear solid on one hand or porous on the other. Border lines and coastlines each mean something slightly different from borders and coasts. They're linguistically specific to English, the, sh the, the channel, and La Manche, you know, denote different things to those who've engaged with them. Uh, my question for all the speakers is this, will Brexit highlight that Irish, Welsh and Scots Gaelic linguistic or cultural experiences of coast, that space for community which is coming ever more to the fore across these islands has been and is distinct from the English language version? I think that's um, a, a very good um, question, like language communities and Anyone got anything they'd like to? I, I, um, I suppose, you know, in some respects, um, you know, you go back to um, Emrys Bowen, who was a former um, uh, head of department in, in the geography department at Aberystwyth, describing the Irish Sea as a, as a Celtic lake. Um, and I think there, there, there was that real sense, if you like, um, of, of the Irish Sea being a, 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 a way of connecting, um, you know, different parts of, uh, uh, of Wales with Ireland uh, and, 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 and further north as well. So I think there's something interesting there in terms of that longer term history and a lot of the projects involved in, in Interreg are, are um, trying to uh, bring those stories back to life, if you like, uh, an ancient connections project is doing that and, and, and also I think ports past and present are doing that in a more uh, more modern kind of context, if you like, in uh, the context of modern history. But the other way maybe which we can think about this is that, you know, is in the context of devolution, and it's a slightly different take, but maybe a different take on, uh, that, that highlights a similar kind of theme almost, that I think looking at things from the perspective of Wales, and particularly Wales seems to be desperately trying to, to, to cast itself in a, in, a, in a different kind of, of, of role and to portray itself in a different kind of light here from what is happening uh, at a UK level, um, trying to, to come up with funding kinds of schemes to continue links between Wales and Ireland uh, post-Brexit. Uh, um, so I think there's a lot going on in that gen general direction, institutions within Wales, our university is, I don't think I'm betraying any confidences, is looking towards Ireland um, and, and seeing, you know, what kinds of links can be made there. So it's not, there, there is something I think quite interesting there in terms of, of language, but I think, um, you know, in, in the context of Wales and Scotland and Ireland, potentially, there may be something else happening there in, in a more uh, political kind of context in the context of devolution in, in Scotland and Wales where we might be trying to forge a different kind of narrative uh, and a different kind of relationship. I might um, add to that as well just because I'm a Irish language speaker and in, in Irish uh, there is a lot of phrases, turns of phrase that are based on the land and on the sea, you know, that pull from those because it's such an old language and I think that says a lot about where the the kind of Irish culture and um, ways of kind of living off the land were um, for so long. And I suppose, you know, the, the idea of borders being fluid, I think the it, it's about looking at the seas and coasts in a different way, that they're not whatever is around Ireland or whatever is around the UK or whatever country you want to say is not, it's not an ownership thing. Uh, it's a kind of a shared fluid thing that moves around. There's actually a really good um, map talking about the illustrative nature of maps, um, a really good map on Bloomberg that shows through colour how kind of fishing vessels move and fish around different coasts. And it's really, really illustrative of how this kind of idea of taking back waters doesn't hold water <laughs> because you can't have that kind of, um, rigid approach to something that moves, you know, in a really simplistic or a really basic way that, you know, um, whether it, it shifts into a change of culture and the language re reflects, because language reacts to real time changes in how society operates, that really depends on what uh, provisions are made for people in the coasts, you know, what amenities and resources and supports are put there to kind of allow 
the coast to thrive. And I don't just mean from a fishing point of view or from a ports and harbour point of view, areas that don't have those things are also important to develop and, and sustain. Thanks very much, everyone. So, um, and then you have another question, a question for you specifically, Gronya. if you have any more details about the Brexit task force. Um, it's a fisheries Brexit task force primarily. I think it'll be made up of fishermen and retail fishing retailers about, um, I suppose, how to develop the industry in any way, but prompted by Brexit because there have been you know, concerns and I suppose it has been left by the wayside for years. That's all I've been told um, so far. Right. And a question which is actually a sort of fairly foundational question of our project, which is um, as a documentary photographer speaking to people in Holyhead after the referendum, some felt that they were simply being used as a thoroughfare. That is, they had a perception that the money traveled through the port and didn't stay in the town. Is this sentiment reflected across the Irish Sea or are the ports perceived more as lifelines and valued? Um, and this is an open question to anyone on the panel. I think that uh, I suppose as with as with most of these things, the answer is very complicated and it's sort of a bit of both. You know, there is no Rosslair town, as I understand it anyway, without Rosslair Harbour. Um, Dublin is a slightly different case, which is a phrase we use a lot on our projects. Um, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock also have, you know, both positive and negative um, relationships with their ports and their infrastructures. Those infrastructures have been increasingly uh, securitized, increasingly separated from those towns, but also those infrastructures are part of the reason that those towns are there or are still there or are still there in the form that they currently take. So I suppose, you know, love-hate would be one kind of way of characterising it. I think that what Brexit does is kind of, and, and again, as James has already suggested, our, our project seeks to make an intervention in this space, uh, a modest one, but an intervention nonetheless. I think Brexit creates an opportunity to kind of reopen a discussion about how these towns and their communities relate to the ports um, that they both rely on and have these very complicated relationships with because there are now these new processes of negotiation about space about where you know lorries are going to park what the trade-offs are uh, in Ross Lair this process of expansion is one that there is at least some potential in my view uh, to create space for you know, new forms of community engagement between or engagement between the port and its community that are hopefully of, of, of kind of mutual benefit. But there are risks. There is the risk that, you know, you run a, you know, pardon my French, bloody great big motorway through the place in order to facilitate quick movement of goods. So there are there are battles to be fought here and conflicts and tensions to be ironed out. Uh, and I think that that is a Kind of characterization of relationships between port towns and the ports that they rely on kind of more generally um, and Brexit kind of reframes and creates a new space within which that kind of conflict will be taking place I think. Uh, I might have something else to add just to that question uh, as well and it's interesting Jonathan brought up as well because I think the relationships with the port and the city or town is uh, reflects kind of the changes of the ports or the su over, uh, over success of the ports look at you know Dublin Port that was originally based around Cable Street which is basically the city centre but now it's kind of much more pushed out so it's just kind of you know for most people they don't engage with the, the port unless they're driving past it along the port tunnel out to the airport and then we see that now in Cork City where they're moving out of their uh, location along the city centre in the docks and, uh, and then uh, Tivoli of their new facility out in Ring of Skiddy. so in time I expect it'll be that relationship sort of, of distance between the city uh, and the port, although um, uh, it will be Cork, the, the, the port of Cork, it'll be Ring of Skiddy, which is, you know, a bit of a distance away. So, and you and you can see how in Dublin Port uh, Company, they've actually tried to re-engage with um, their role in the city and they've had some outreach programs. 
um, recently in terms of like cultural to kind of see you know how much of them is, is anchored we'll say within the history of the, the, um, the uh, uh, city and then to the other question then about with you know with um, Hollyhead where the money doesn't stay I think that's where we just I think there's the kind of the infrastructure where Dublin and Corpus Horn I think is, is where trade comes and stays or is moved out while you look at from what I can imagine with Hollyhead it's largely just a roll on roll off ferry port where it doesn't deal with like bulk or lift on lift off container stuff so there's it is just like that it's a, a destination uh, either to go or to leave from just with um, lorries which which it which is a shame and um, I do know people who have gone through uh, Hollyhead and it's a town that maybe you know needs a bit of TLC it is kind of like following behind even though it has such it is the UK's second business uh, busiest port after Dover after Dover because of the trade with uh, Dublin alone yet it, nothing it doesn't seem to see that economic benefits stay in the town which is a shame uh, considering so much of the traffic does pass through it. Excellent so next question is for Grania and it says do most fishers in the area you study take fishing as full-time employment? Uh, what kind of work do women normally do in these communities? How has Brexit affected people uh, who are from these coastal and fishing communities uh, but may not take fishing as a full-time job? Yeah, um, it's a very um, interesting question about who are making up when we talk about what people want from their coastal communities, who are these people? I think it's hard to say fishing is a full-time job or part-time. Uh, it's definitely people's livelihoods, to put it that way, that I've spoken to. Um, and it would be very much seen as a family business, you know, and, and that's where the, the love for for it comes from because it's a kind of a source of pride to continue the, the, uh, the family trade. Um, the, I'm not sure exactly what kind of work uh, women do in the communities, but again, if it is a family business, business generally um, families kind of chip in. I think the question about what kind of um, secondary effect the fisheries industry have on coastal communities is a really good one. When I was talking to fisher, fishermen about the impact of uh, Brexit, um, they said, one, one guy said to me that if you lose, if they lost all access to UK waters, that's 50%, 40-50% of where they catch, where they catch 40-50% of their stock, that has a knock-on impact on all the people employed by the fishing industry as a whole, which is production, you know, packaging, that kind of thing, um, marketing. So of, I think that would represent around 2,000 jobs, which doesn't sound, 2,000, 4,000 jobs, which doesn't sound huge, but in those areas, in, you know, Donegal, it is a huge blow to the region if that were to happen, and that's the fear. It's not that Ireland as a whole would be damaged or would take a hit, it's more that those specific communities where this is a real part of their identity or they're a part of their community, that that would be impacted, uh, severely impacted. Yeah, I'd just like to add in uh, just what Grania was saying there um, in terms of um, exactly what she said there, where, um, which was an argument that was often said with, with during the Brexit referendum in 2016 and all through last year, where it was like fisheries, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think I remember reading in 2016 um, uh, during the UK referendum that um, veterinarians and private detectives contribute more to the UK economy than fishing, uh, which it shows where, but then you go to places like Fraser Bar or Peterhead. Uh, or in the Shetland Islands, where it is the only thing there, and particularly like that, uh, that's the same then in, in the cases of Ireland, like Killy Beggs or Castletown Bear or Dunmore East, where it, you know it is the reason why uh, why it's there, or, or of why it's there. Like Castletown Bear is a town of oh, about eight or nine hundred people, uh, and if there is you know. Uh, like that there's a big uh, pelagic section of the fleet there and they catch of course pelagic then would be related then of course to um, herring and mackerel as I was speaking about there so if they lose access to those waters particularly around the likes of um, of the UK um, you know if that is that 30 or 40 jobs lost and for a town that size that's quite a lot um, so there is a kind of a secondary aspect in terms of what happens with the, with the Brexit. Uh, and then I have to agree with Ron there about kind of the livelihood as aspects, which is very true. 
Um, like sometimes it's not the case, you, be, you know, it depends on what sector of the industry you're in. Sometimes you might be, you know, if you're inshore, you're kind of largely tipping away most months of the year, while maybe for a pelagic, there's sections of the year maybe where like you've made enough and you maybe work on the farm or you go into construction or you do other kind of secondary things around the area to kind of keep you tipping over in those months uh, in between when you're not out at sea. So for example, at the um, mackerel fishery, normally um, most of it happens kind of um, uh, like as as the as the mackerel moves uh, from Norway south to off Ireland, the, the the sweet spot to catch them um, uh, because of the raw content is when they're off Scotland. Unfortunately for us, in terms of Brexit, because that's where the access issues come into. But that happens generally around kind of uh, um, yeah around now, uh, December January, because then as I said in February is when it starts spawning. Then and the quality they're still good to eat, but the the, the value goes down. So, um, so like that, most of the pelagic might have finished up by February or by March, and then there's other, you know, you might go on the tuna then maybe, uh, the bluefin tuna maybe then in July, and then maybe then in August, September, then the season starts up um, again with other fisheries. So um, so it's uh, it's multifaceted like that in terms of what ports do, but it is always with that question about Brexit, uh, if the, you know, if the secondary, it's the shopkeeper, it's the person running the b, &B it's the restaurant owner, um, those are the people who rely uh, on on uh, fishing in those towns because in Castletown Bear, there's going to be no data center, there's going to be no Ernest and Young, there'll be no Facebook. You know, it is this, and then maybe the tourism that comes along seasonally, or those other small things that might come along in terms of you know, um, um, you know, construction or farming and stuff like that. So it's the you know. You know, um, the, you know, two or three thousand jobs lost is for the fishing industry because of potentially from Brexit would you know devastate those kind of small uh, isolated areas like Castletown Bear. Excellent, thank you all. So we have five or five to six minutes left, and fortunately, we've been provided with actually a question I would have asked if someone else hadn't asked it, because it's a very nice, big, open question to go out with, which is to all of you: with the increased political focus on coastal communities, will Brexit be a good or a bad thing for those communities in the longer term after the initial turmoil? And I suppose it's a good chance to reflect on maybe just to sort of top off what you've already said with some speculations, which uh, as Jonathan said, well, well, there'll probably be a new, something that comes along tomorrow and uh, contradicts them. I mean, the short answer is I don't know, honestly, um, because the turmoil is, is not going away. The turmoil is what Brexit is. Um, and, you know, that having been said, there, you know, there is ongoing talk about when things settle down, when, when, you know, when trade levels return to their their usual, when trade returns to its usual levels across the Irish Sea. I, I honestly don't know if that's going to happen. I really don't know whether the boom in interest in, or, uh, you know, boom in demand for moving goods from Ireland directly to the European continent is likely to remain at, at the levels that it's currently at, or or not, um, whether it will revert in some way, shape or form to the land bridge, I, I don't know. Um, so I think um, that there are, you know, perhaps being pessimistic, more risks than there are opportunities in all of this for all of us um, who share these islands. But I think those risks and opportunities break down slightly differently in different places. And I suppose it's a question of maximising opportunities. So to return to Ross Lair, which is, you know, um, I'm sort of waving as a poster child, I suppose, for where they, some of these opportunities potentially exist with inward investment into the port, with its new status as this kind of central node on um, Ireland to European supply chains. Do opportunities come with that? I think so, but I think there are risks too. And I suppose it's about how those are navigated. Um, and I'm encouraged by the formation of this task force uh, around fisheries, for example, is there potential, that, albeit that it comes at an extremely late stage uh, in a way that speaks to some of the issues that I, that I, I think I raised in my talk. So. Yeah, short answer, I don't know. Long waffly answer is, you know, it remains to be seen and that there are, there are huge, huge risks for all of us across these islands. We haven't even talked about Northern Ireland um, and I could uh, and would go on at some length, but I'm not going to. Um, 
where the risks are particular. So I think there are big risks for all of us, but there are opportunities here too. And the, the political tide is going to continue to ebb and flow with, with unpredictable consequences, I think. I'll, I'll follow on then if we if we if we stick to to roughly the same order maybe but um, I think the question almost about you know the increased political focus I suppose I'd, I'd question whether there is that increased political focus in somewhere like the UK uh, and it depends who's doing the focusing almost um, I think uh, there's a lot of different organisations you know having some kind of interest in. Uh, these coastal communities, in particular, I suppose, the, the ports that we've been, we've been dealing with as part of ports past and present. The UK, obviously, is, is investing in, in these coastal communities. But again, uh, in the whole debate around Brexit and the border and so on, and, and the whole national narrative at a UK level was about the, the, the border with mainland Europe. I think the, the, the border between Wales uh, and Ireland, I think, was was often a very forgotten one. I think, uh, and, and I think that doesn't bode particularly well for those ports um, uh, connecting Wales and Ireland. For Wales, as I said, mentioned earlier on, I think, as a, as a devolved administration, I think there is an appetite to look westwards, and, and the ports themselves might benefit because of that. But even at a smaller scale within Wales, we've you know we've had this mad rush to create city regions. Everyone is creating city regions, you know, everywhere in the world it seems. Certainly in the UK, um, and, and and there's been a drive to create city regions here. But very often, you know, the, the ports themselves in Wales represent the back end. Uh, um, probably is a polite way of saying it. Uh, the back end of these city regions, maybe uh, the cities are uh, city regions are focused on places like Manchester, Swansea, uh, and so places like Hollyhead, Fishguard, Pembroke Dock, they are somewhere back there. We don't really, I don't know, pay much attention to those. So again, in that kind of context, political context, then the ports are perhaps, you know, there's a danger of them becoming forgotten. Um, so I think that that would be my bigger point, I suppose, in the context of the UK. It depends who's doing the political focusing and whether they are focusing to that extent uh, or to an equal extent on, on, on the port communities in Wales, for instance. Yeah, I, I think it, there is a chance that there's it's definitely an opportunity to not continue as things were, but there's this big d disruption, this big political and practical disruption to how things were. And that's always an opportunity to improve things. There is a danger, I suppose, that um, through grants or other supports that they try and maintain the status quo without developing industries affected by Brexit and communities disproportionately affected by Brexit without kind of developing them. I, I think there's a, a lesson in the pandemic as well in terms of the coasts of the idea of countries working together to fight to combat a common problem because there's no point in having a a singular approach to those issues like climate change, issues like health, uh, and and I I think that fits in nicely with the the um, re envisaging coasts um, idea, uh, and as well as that the kind of reversion maybe to more rural parts of countries now that if people can uh, live and uh, work. In more rural areas, that in itself will help reinvigorate them. Um, the idea of passing, I, I, I think Brexit in particular is good for reimagining Ireland and uh, the UK's relationship because if we look at how, you know, as was mentioned before, the passing through of ports, you know, how important the land bridge is, but that's not really a proper depth of a relationship between the two uh, jurisdictions. So I suppose um, even if it does revert back to that, there needs to be more cultural, um, long lasting uh, connections between the two um, that isn't just passing through to get from one place to the next, um, particularly with, you know, Wales and England. Um, I think the, the, I suppose the, whether it will be a success or not depends on how much um, how much focus is done to, to, to and planning is done um, and there needs to be a bit of I'm, I'm a big fan of dialogue I'm a big fan of like talking about what do people want what do people want to imagine instead of a kind of a crisis management firefighting approach to 
uh, creating a kind of a community or a future for people um, beyond what it's always been like or what it always has been. Great, and I'll um, bring up the, the end um, with some optimism, I think, um, relating to the question. Um, I think the kind of um, like political focus uh, on kind of coast communities, we're, we're uh, thankfully the case we're a bit with ahead on this. Um, back in 2011, 2012, um, uh, the government uh, launched um, Our Ocean Wealth, which is kind of Ireland's first attempt at, at a coordinated maritime policy. And again, as Jonathan mentioned earlier with a, a quote I said, where like we're an island nation with the landlocked mentality, um, you know, it, it in, in 2011, our an island country launched its first maritime policy, which was great, but it took quite a while for the state to actually get around to doing that, which reveals many of the things with the role of agriculture and everything else that um, we've, we've, we've heard uh, uh, earlier today. Um, uh, and that uh, relates more to kind of, you know, uh, linking things with tourism, with coastal tourism, with offshore wind energy and everything else to try and, you know, see, you know, where we're falling down. And so there's a more coordinated approach from departments and with government. And, you know, through this, they were actually able to um, identify how much is earned through the maritime and ocean economy in Ireland, which I think one of the most recent reports um, from our ocean wealth is about 6.1 billion, which is great when you think about it, how much is there, considering how much maybe relates, obviously, with, you know, agriculture, pharmaceuticals or others. So there's that kind of I think awareness and process already in place um, with the political system to be engaged uh, with all things coastal and everything else. Brexit has magnified that and particularly um, everything with uh, from uh, land bridge and ports um, to fisheries and then as Grania talked about there's that task force which, which has just been set up which shows that there is this initiative and want from the government and from departments to engage with people who are affected by Brexit. So, um, so, and, but while I'm optimistic with that, there is the unknowns that might come with Brexit, where it might all be turned on its head by this time next year, and you know, it it, uh, it might go sideways. But I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that um, that our coastal communities will endure. Excellent, and thanks so much uh, to Jonathan, Reese, Gronya, and Kieran for like a great set of talks and for answering all the Q and A's um, in a really engaged way. Um, I hope that's a heaping helping of coastal connections for you on a Thursday evening. Um, now, I'm just, just going to drop the link in the chat for the series as a whole, um, just to say um, my colleague Mel, for, who's one of our other conveners for the series, has been tweeting on at Coastal Seminars. So there's a thread about this uh, about this webinar that you can go have a look at on, uh, on Twitter. Um, I'll be uh, putting up the recording on our podcast uh, in the coming days. Uh, and uh, just, just a little plug from that series that there's one session coming up on the 25th of February you can sign up for on Vanishing Coasts, which you can go to from that link, um, which would sign up to in the same way as you did this one. And there's Coastal Dystopias on the 18th of March. Um, so a slightly ominous air to the titles, but they are very rich and um, interesting topics um, with a lot of different perspectives and connections that I hope you'll join us for in the future. So uh, yeah, follow along. And uh, with that, I press stop on the recording and say thank you and have a great evening. And thanks again to all our speakers. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, listening to our webinar and uh, I've been your sound engineer, James Smith, and I was also the chair of the webinar. You can expect future webinars uh, over 2021 and 22 from the Coastal Connection series. Next up on the 25th of February at 2 p.m. GMT, Irish Standard Time, etc., is uh, Vanishing Coasts. Then the, the one for March is on the 18th, uh, also 2 p.m. GMT IST on the topic of coastal dystopias. You can find those at history.ac.uk forward slash partnership hyphen seminar.